shall we start again? Do you are there any questions or comments or Okay, so um, I mean to, to summarize, so we, we discussed this relationship between certain gauge theories uh, and certain gravity backgrounds. I wasn't very specific in defining the gauge theory, so it's a three plus one dimensional gauge theory with maximal supersymmetry. Those who, if you want, I can explain it a little more, or if you are satisfied with this, we can continue with this. Um, so it contains the Yam Mills action we discussed plus some other fields. Um, and then we discussed this uh, string theory in five dimensional anti sitter space. Uh, that I, was the space I erased. That's the near horizon geometry of this tube that we discussed. So of this kind of black brain. So if you go very close to this black hole horizon that I described before, the geometry very close to it is uh, the geometry of five-dimensional anti-sitter. That that's where this came from. And we had said that the all excitations living very close to here would, um, would be described by the Young Mills theory. Okay? Um, I should mention that uh, we discussed the boundary of anti-sitter space, right? So this boundary where the gravitational potential goes to infinity corresponds to Moving towards the boundary corresponds to moving sort of away from the near horizon region. And so if you are if you have an object that has finite energy here in this near horizon region and you are very deep inside, it will be very difficult for you to climb back out of this potential well. Okay? It's like you're living down here and you don't have enough energy to climb out. And so in the real situation where it, in a situation where this connects to flat space, this barrier is not infinite, but kind of saturates at some point, and then the space continues, right? And if you are living deep inside in the bottom, this barrier looks infinitely big, and it looks like you are in infinite ADS space, as opposed to the one where which has the barrier. Uh, question, please. Yeah. Uh, but you're calling it a black hole, but not a black hole in the term that it's uh, that is infinitely deep then, I guess. No, 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 no. OK, yeah. So let me let me connect it to the ordinary notion of black holes, just to, so, so that becomes a little clearer that um, what I'm talking about. So let's, uh, let's consider a Schwarzschild black hole. So that's the black hole everyone uh, likes or knows. Uh, well, maybe, okay. not everyone. Okay. So it has this metric. Uh, OK, so this has uh, some metric. So far away becomes the metric of flat space. This is the sphere, the radial direction. All of this far away becomes R3. And here we have the redshift factor, which is what we were talking about. Okay? This, red, this factor that becomes zero at the black hole horizon. For a black hole, the only factor that becomes zero is this one that becomes zero very close to the black hole horizon. Okay? Only, one, only one direction. Okay. Now, one could consider in four dimensions also charged black holes. Um, and they have a metric which is very similar to this, um, with the minor difference that, um, let's say, uh, this appears squared. Well, let me. There are black holes which are charged, and black holes which are charged have a metric which, roughly speaking, has the same form. Not, not, not exactly the same, but uh, they have the same form in the sense that they have a single zero at uh, r equal to zero. So if we expand this metric around r equal to zero for small delta around r equal to zero, so the this is the geometry of the near horizon region, and by res by redefining delta, this come this looks essentially like flat space. So that those are uh, black holes, ordinary black holes. Um, then you can consider charged black holes, and when you have charged black holes, you have the constraint that in order to have no singularities, the mass should be bigger or equal than the charge in some units. And when you take the extremal limit, um, the geometry really develops a double zero here, so that the near hori horizon geometry has the form, let's say, delta squared, d tau squared plus d delta squared over delta squared. Okay. Now, if we define, and, and then the 
the sphere acquires a constant radius, so d omega 2. And if we define delta equal to 1 over c, this becomes minus uh, d tau squared plus dc squared over c squared. Okay? The metric of a space, which uh, we can call ADS2. So this is the two-dimensional analog of, uh, of what we were doing before. So the sense in which this black object is different is that it's extremal. Okay? It's close to extremal. It has this physically what it would mean is that the Hawking temperature would be zero. So this guy has non-zero Hawking temperature and this would have zero Hawking temperature. Um, now another sense in which it is different is that um, the black hole is localized in space. These objects are extended in space you know, along the spatial directions, right? Around, for example, three spatial dimensions. So in that sense, it's different. So it's a black brain rather than a black hole. Okay. But other than that, it's uh, exactly the same as, uh, as an ordinary black hole. And in fact, this type of ADS spaces appeared first in, this, this, in the context of these extremal black holes. Um, they have, uh, yeah. Um, any other question? No. Um, OK. Um, OK, very good. Now, one more general thing I, I, I should say to connect to what I discussed in the very beginning is that um, we, we discussed these strings that um, exist in large end gauge theories, where the strings are just made out of uh, sort of correlations between the colors of the quarks, right? This, uh, or the colors of the gluons and antigluons. So we had the gluon and the antigluon, and we had this chain. And there were these strings that were, in some sense, some kind of strings. And they exist in any theory, in any uh, large end theory, in the limit n goes to infinity, um, for fixed lambda. So if lambda is fixed, lambda is g square n. So when we hold the coupling, then make n go to infinity and make g very small so that lambda is fixed. In this regime, there will always be strings. And they will be weakly coupled. The string interaction constant will be of order 1 over n. Okay? And uh, they are strings in the sense that the perturbation expands. So you can expand their free energy or their, the correlation functions and so on. In terms of diagrams, you can draw the plane and the torus and so on. And the idea is that those strings are the same as the fundamental strings of string theory, the same as essentially those 10 dimensional strings, but living on a curved background. Okay? So the strings, the strings of QCD are not living in four dimensions, but they are living in five dimensions. Okay? That, that is uh, one of, well, that's uh, an important point here. Um, they are living in higher dimensions in the same way that all the, uh, in the same way that other excitations here live in higher dimensions. They are made out of, uh, so objects which are made out of composite, they are composite here, they are made out of many gluons and so on. Um, in, uh, they, uh, they really are living in this higher dimensional space. Okay. Of course, the description in terms of the higher dimensional space is not super useful if the radius of curvature is comparable to the string scale because we cannot solve it very easily. And it's more useful when the radius of curvature is large, which is the strongly coupled regime. Okay? So when you are at very strong coupling, so g square n much bigger than 1, so then this side is easy. You can use gravity, forget about string theory, forget where it came from, and so on. So if you are only interested in jan mills theory at very strong coupling, you can forget about string theory. You can just take this and do gravity calculations. And Never ever think about string theory unless you run into some problems and then you need to remember whether uh, those string corrections are becoming important or not. Um, okay. So now I was planning to uh, describe in a little more detail uh, how to um, understand the mapping of states that you have on this side to uh, the states you have here on the on this side. I was planning to make a little more precise this notion that, for example, a graviton is a pair of gluons. So in what sense is a graviton a pair of gluons? 
I was trying to make a little more precise this. And we can make this more precise by uh, explaining this in a slightly more uh, abstract way, which, uh, w which is really the best way to understand it uh, when you are dealing with, let's say, strongly coupled systems and so on. Um, OK. And this is uh, the following. So the first part of what I'm going to explain here is, I explained right now, is uh, purely kinematics. Is, uh, so she asks how to describe the, the states. So that's what I mean by kinematics. So we need to find a convenient set of coordinates and a convenient uh, description for this so that um, we can think about it in, a most, in the most clear way. Um, and first, we need to think about the states of um, yam mills theory. So what's a convenient way of thinking about it? So as I said, we create some excitation, and the excitation becomes very big. So um, it seems like we can't keep track very much of the excitations. They go to infinity. The energy spectrum would be continuous. So it's not, I mean, we could, in principle, describe it from that point of view, but it's a little less clear. Uh, when you have a system with massless degrees of freedom, a useful thing to do sometimes is to uh, put the theory on a finite, on finite volume. Right? We put the system on a box, and then we get a discrete spectrum, and so on. So in this case, the box is a three-sphere. So we can consider the yam mills theory, or the theory on a three-sphere, uh, times r. Um, and um, in this case, we... Um, we could consider that theory on uh, this cylinder now. We, we could also view it as a cylinder. So this circle here is S3, and this line is just time. Okay. And uh, now we are in finite volume. The spectrum of the theory will be discrete. So for example, if you had a free massless field, and you put it on this S3, well, there will be a series of uh, harmonics on the three sphere, and those will be a series of discrete energies, some energies. Now, th this picture is related to the picture of the pl on the plane, but uh, and, and it's, it's useful to keep in mind this relationship because it's useful um, to use it to label the states that uh, propagate on this cylinder. So it will give us a way to construct uh, states here, okay? in a way that is very independent of details. So the relationship is the following. So you can imagine that you have R4, Euclidean R4. So here we could consider this to be Euclidean time or Lorentzian time. Let's just consider it to be Euclidean time. Um, and then in R4, we could, uh, we could view the evolution not as uh, occurring in ordinary Euclidean time, which would run in this way, but in Euclidean time, which runs along the radial direction. Um, and then, uh, and then essentially we get the map to this picture because uh, so if we write the metric as dr squared plus r squared d omega three, that's the metric of r four, and we divide everything by r squared. Okay. We divided everything by r squared, so we or we pull out the factor of r squared. So this metric inside here is the metric of a three sphere times a line which is log of r. That's tau here. Well, I didn't write what tau was. But this line would be um, log r. And so these two metrics differ by an overall factor, scale factor. But if you have a, a theory that uh, is scale invariant, and in particular also uh, conformal invariant, I guess I didn't explain what conformal invariance is. Do, do people, do I need to explain it or? No? They don't care. I hear more no's than yes. Okay. So in conformal theories, the trace of the stress tensor is zero. So if we change the overall factor of the metric, the, the met if we change the metric by an overall factor, the theory doesn't change. So the observables and things we are computing don't change. And so anything we compute in R4 is the same as, thing, uh, as doing the same computation on S3 times R. Um, okay. Now, so in particular, there is a mapping between all possible operators we can have, we can insert here at the origin. So operators at the origin. 
at the origin get mapped to uh, states here. So all different states that can run on S3, that you can have on S3. Okay? For each, so the theory on S3 has a whole Hilbert space of states. For each state in the Hilbert space, there is an operator we can add here at the origin. Okay? Now this looks like a lot of states and so on. So let me just explain this in the context of a simple scalar field. Let's say you have a massless scalar field in R4, so phi, and you can insert you can first don't do anything, in insert nothing here. So inserting nothing here corresponds to here having the vacuum of the theory, okay? Propagating. You can insert the operator phi of zero, phi at the origin. That would correspond to exciting uh, here, th the field here in the lowest uh, Kaluza line uh, harmonic. The harmonic which is constant on the sphere, uh, there is one little technical point I need to explain. So when you have a massless scalar field here, uh, here on the sphere, what you get is a scalar field that um, is just the usual Laplacian on the sphere uh, plus one unit of mass. This one unit of mass comes from the conformal coupling to the curvature and so on. Let, let's say it's a technical thing that uh, in order for this to work, we need to add this mass. There is a very good reason for adding it, but let me not explain it a lot. So this corresponds to taking this uh, scalar field, considering it doesn't vary on the sphere. This has zero angular momentum. So it doesn't vary under the sphere. It's like a harmonic oscillator in the time direction. So that's a single harmonic oscillator mode. Okay? You can consider the field. So that was so this. So nothing. Nothing corresponds to the vacuum state in the field theory. This corresponds to a simple one of these harmonic oscillator modes. Uh, this corresponds to two harmonic oscillator modes, phi squared of zero. Mm. Derivative mu of phi of zero, some other operator, uh, corresponds to some other harmonic oscillator, a mu, because now we are going to expand in kaluza klein harmonics. Uh, in, in we are going to expand in spherical harmonics on the S3. And uh, so for each spherical harmonic, we get a harmonic oscillator and, and so on. And the energy of these various states, so this has some energy zero, let's say this has energy one, two, et cetera, um, corresponds to the scaling dimension of this operator, how these operators behave and the rescaling of coordinates. Okay, so that's, um, uh, that's this story. Now what this, this enables us to do, uh, looks like somewhat abstract, this dictionary. Uh, this, is, this is something you can do in any, in any field theory. It has nothing to do with the gauge gravity duality. In any scale invariant theory, you can do this. In the uh, critical icing model, you can do this. In, the, uh, you know, uh, in, in any theory that is scale invariant, this is a convenient way to think about this. Um, Now, if we are now in the context of the gauge gravity duality, then uh, we can do one more column. And we can do the, uh, since this is something we can do in any field theory, in particular, we can do it in a theory that has a gravity dual. And then this cylinder uh, corresponds, so this is some cylinder, and it corresponds to the boundary of some way of writing ADS5, um, where it has some metric uh, of the form minus, let's say, cosh rho squared, d tau squared plus d rho squared plus sinh Okay, so so here we are just simply writing the same metric that we uh, wrote before, but in a different set of coordinates where it covers different regions and so on. Uh, view it as a different way of thinking about ADS5 space here. And view this as uh, the version of ADS5 space that describes best the theory on S3 times R. Okay. So in this way of thinking about ADS space, the G0, the gravitational potential, rises very fast as you go to the boundary. So here I'm just drawing, now it's a solid cylinder. So the boundary is a hollow cylinder, only the surface of the cylinder. 
ADS space is the whole cylinder, the interior of the cylinder. Okay. And the gravitational potential is a minimum at the origin, at rho equal to zero, and then it rises in all directions. So a particle that is here will oscillate uh, back and forth. It will not go to infinity as it was going before. Okay. There is a relationship between the two ADS spaces that I can explain if you're curious, but uh, for this point of view, view this as two different ways of thinking about it. Here, we see that the physics agrees with the physics we expect um, on a finite size box where, um, on, a fi yeah, on, on a sphere where um, the spectrum is discrete. So if you put in a particle, a massive particle in the bulk, its minimum energy configuration is to put it here at the bottom. We can take the same particle and excite it and make it uh, oscillate back and forth. And that would correspond to taking uh, some uh, excitation of this field theory. And then uh, oscillating this back and forth would correspond to having, uh, so th th this is the sphere on the boundary. And when this is, let's say, closer to this region of the sphere, the excitations are concentrated more on this region than more concentrated on this region and less concentrated in that, that region. And when it's oscillating in the other direction, it concentrates more. Uh, it concentrates much more in this region than in this region. Okay, and when it's sitting at the bottom, it's uh, concentrated everywhere. I mean, it's uniformly distributed over the whole sphere. Okay. Good. Um. Okay, and in this way, we can think about the various states. And the various states are going to be created by operators. So if we have an operator such as the stress tensor, um, T mu nu, which is the trace of, let's say, F mu delta, F nu delta, etc. cetera. Uh, this operator acting on the vacuum of the field theory will create a state. If we have very weak coupling, it will create just two gluons will create two gluons moving on the sphere. The two gluons will be moving on the sphere with minimal amount. If we set the, if we put the stress tensor at the origin, they will be moving with minimal amount of energy. On the sphere, will create the minimal amount of energy st uh, state with spin two, uh, where the spins of the two gluons add up to spin two. Um, um, that we could have. That's what we have in the field theory. In the gravity theory, we just have a mode of the graviton, so a massless graviton. Um, massless gravity wave that is uh, oscillating between these two gravitational potential wells and which carries the minimal amount of energy allowed by quantum mechanics. Okay? Now, naively, you might think that the massless particle can have zero energy and that's the minimal amount of energy, but this is a particle that is forced to live in a space with a gravitational potential well, so it has to have some non-zero momentum in the radial directions, so it has to have some non-zero energy. And its energy will be small and non-zero, and we can figure out exactly what uh, its energy should be. And for that, we need a little more of kinematics. So uh, I mentioned that the energy here uh, would be um, the time translation symmetry. So let me call this d tau squared. So we can measure energies with respect to this time on these pictures. That is, means we measure energies um, we measure energies in units where the radius of the sphere is 1. And on this side, uh, that amounts essentially um, to uh, measure energies in uh, units of this, uh, of this time here. Um, and OK. And then if you have, for example, I uh, need a couple of more formulas. So you, you find that um, the stress tensor here has some scaling dimensions. So stress, en st stress energy tensor in three dimensions has units of uh, energy divided by volume cubed. Okay, energy divided by den energy density, energy divided by volume, or length cubed. So this is energy divided by length cubed, or this is one over length to the fourth. Okay, so it has units of one over length to the fourth power, and something like that we call. There is something we call. Anomalous the dimension, which an dimension is how many units of one over length it has, and for the stress tensor in four dimensions is four. Okay. And what this means here is that uh, just, and th this follows simply from the fact that the stress energy tensor is a spin two 
uh, operator that is conserved, that obeys a conservation equation. That, by some math little mathematics that I don't have to time to explain, uh, implies its dimension should be 4. Um, I mean, it's basically the same as this, uh, as this calculation we did here. So, um, and, uh, so on this side, the, we have a graviton that uh, will have a very long wavelength of order the, the, the size of this potential well is of the order of the radius of curvature of ADS space. So the proper energy of this graviton will be of the order of 1 over r. And uh, when we measure it with respect to this time, which differs by an amount of order r, we find that the energy with respect to this time tau that we define here is exactly equal to 4. And to, to do this properly requires solving the wave equation for the graviton in the interior, uh, which is uh, essentially straightforward. Well, you have to deal with the indices and a little messy, but uh, you it can be done. Um, but you know, before you do it, you know what result you're supposed to get, because the result is given by uh, the symmetries. Um, now, in the same way, you can consider uh, other operators. And for each operator, you uh, find the corresponding state. Just for as an expla simple explanation, let me say, imagine you have a very heavy particle of mass m, proper mass m here. Then the energy with respect to this time of that particle uh, will be essentially m times some factor of r that comes from the redshift factor between proper time and this kind of time, let's say at rho equal to 0, where this factor is unity. So we'll got have r times m. So this will be uh, the, uh, the corresponding dimension of the operator in the boundary theory for a particle of mass m. So from here, you see the following. So that if the masses are, if you have dimensions of order 1, like 4 or 6 or whatever, uh, then it means that the mass is com it will, be go will be going like some number divided by r, right? So this corresponds to particles whose wavelength are c is comparable to the, si the radius of curvature. Okay? I'm just trying to, um, the, the goal of what I'm trying to explain now is to explain the um, typical sizes or wavelengths of uh, operators which have dimensions of order 1, like the stress tensor, which has dimension 4. Okay. And they are objects which are very extended. They have a wave, a wave function which is very, it's like a massless particle in its lowest energy state. In a box of size r, you will have wavelengths which is 1 over r. Right? That's what we're finding here, and it's all consistent with this. Okay. Different points of view. I'm, I'm just explaining this, the same thing from different points of view. Is it being clear? Is it clear? Yep. Um, okay. Um, now, if you had a particle whose mass is uh, much higher than 1 over the radius of curvature, um, then the corresponding dimension would be very, very, would be very high. Um, so, okay. Now, so that's uh, some kinematics. And so in particular, for example, uh, let, let's discuss this again as a, the, this question of the string state. Imagine we want to trust gravity. So the string is very small, and the masses of strings are, there, is, there are the masses which are 0 in, ten, in 5 or 10 dimensions, and then there are the masses which are of order 1 over Ls. Um, and they would correspond to dimensions or energies which are of order r divided by ls. So you see that um, to the extent where we can neglect the massive, uh, so, so neglecting the massive string modes will only be possible if the radius is much bigger than one in string units. That was the condition for trusting gravity. And that implies that the dimensions of those states should be uh, much larger than one. This is if gravity is good. Okay. Okay. Now, now, what types of states does a uh, gauge theory uh, have? So I'm trying to now explain um, the connection between 
the weakly coupled version of uh, gauge theory and the strong coupling version. Um, well, we, we discussed the graviton. If, let me ignore the indices, OK? Just not to clutter too much, I'm going to ignore the indices a little bit. Um, so this is like trace FF, OK? That's, that was the stress tensor. That had dimension 4 and spin 2. Now, there are also some other operators which spin 4, which roughly speaking could be viewed as f derivative square f. Okay? They have a weak coupling. They have dimension 6. Okay? This is when g squared and is much less than 1. And we can ask, what, what do they do at strong coupling? And in, in a theory of gravity, there are no um, you, you have typically particles of spin 2, but no, no light particles of spin or higher spin. I mean, in fact, the interactions of particles of high, light particles of high spin are very, very strongly constrained. Um, I mean, both, uh, let's say, experimentally and even theoretically. Um, and so we certainly, if gravity is a good approximation, we don't expect any massless, par massless higher spin particles. If the dimension was exactly 6, its mass would be exactly 0 here in the right-hand side. And so if we want gravity to be a good approximation, one of the things that should happen is that the mass of that particle has to be very large at strong coupling. Okay? And you can compute it at one loop. So let's say at one loop you get g squared and something of order g squared. And so it, it goes in the right direction. Um, so in other words, what you expect is the following for this state. So as a function of lambda, so we have the dimension. So let's say we have 6 here. Uh, and then it starts rising linearly from uh, this correction. And a strong coupling, you expect it to be very fairly high. Now, how high? Well, it would the only, let's say, the first spin 4 states in string theory come from the massive string states, which have mass of order 1 over the, the string length. And um, they have this dimension, r over ls. And if you remember, but you don't have to remember, that when like some power is actually one fourth of the of lambda, right? So this is the behavior at very large lambda that we expect. Okay. So this is what we should get if uh, we can uh, from the string theories weekly. Well, from a string moving on a space whose radius of curvature is very large, we get this. From perturbative young mills, we get this type of dependence. And you can ask, what do we get in between? Okay. Now, one of the recent, one of the recent advances in the last, um, last few years was to be able to actually compute this cur whole curve exactly. So you can compute it as a solution of a of uh, an integral equation. You have to solve the equation numerically, but you can compute it. And it matches beautifully the weak coupling answer with the strong coupling answer. Okay. So um, this is computed in the planar limit. So in this limit, where la n goes to infinity with, with <coughs> lambda fixed. And you can actually do the calculation. So it's, uh, it uses the techniques of integrable models. Uh, for those who knows wh who knows what, what that is. Um, OK, so now let me uh, explain uh, one thing that is useful for understanding when we think about these things. I, I try to summarize the relationship between string, gravity, and the large end limit in a way that is as general as possible. Uh, so, so in general, we have the first two points. First is that when the radius of ADS, or the radius of curvature of these spaces where you have the gauge gravity duality, is much bigger than L Planck, then this is if and only if uh, n is much bigger than 1. Now. What I mean by radius of ADS here is any radius of curvature of the space that is dual to your field theory. 
And by n, I mean the number of degrees of freedom of your field theory, or the n of the un matrix. So this is a general property. And remem remember, Planck is what governs this, the gravitational interactions. And it's again what governs this planar expansion and so on. So, um, so always, in order to have a gravity dual, a first necessary condition is to have n much bigger than 1. Okay? Always. So if someone comes and tells you, I have a gravity dual of the Eisen model, then you are going to be a little skeptical because the gravity dual of the, of the Eisen model will be a very strongly quantum theory of gravity. Okay? Um, because what governs the classical approximation to the theory of gravity is how, how, difference, how different L LS is from L Planck. Okay? This is what governs the, uh, the extent to which gravitational waves are, are weakly coupled. Okay? Is that um, and second, then we have um, the radius of ADS um, much bigger than LS, right? And in general, when the when the string length is well is defined at all, this will always be much bigger than L Planck. Okay, this this will always be uh, whenever there is a, some kind of string, and then. Um, this implies that lambda is much bigger than 1. Okay? So whenever the radius of curvature is bigger than the string size, which is also necessary for in order to have a gravity approximation, you need that the coupling should be very strong. Now, you might have strong coupling and still uh, not, not necessarily have uh, a space that is weakly coupled everywhere. You, you do have it in n equal to 4, but in general not. But this is uh, definitely a uh, necessary condition. So any theory that is, uh, has a gravity dual will, be necessarily, will, will necessarily be strongly coupled. And the reason it has to be strongly coupled is because operators like this that have higher spin have to gain large energies, have to have uh, large dimensions. And the only way they ha have can have large energies is that the interactions are strong. I mean, the weakly coupled picture of this thing is just two gluons moving. Um, sloshing back and forth on the sphere. So the two gluons are moving independently, and as you increase the spin, it means the two gluons are moving completely independently of each other. And as you crank up the, the coupling, there is a stronger interaction, a stronger um, 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 color uh, interaction between them that pushes their energy to higher value. Okay? So the mental picture you should have is that theories that have a gravity dual are strongly interacting theories where many of the states in the spectrum have been pushed to very high energies, and you're left with a small subset, subset of the possible excitations of the theory. The smaller subset are some will always include the graviton because the stress energy tensor has protected dimension, and, and maybe some other ones that, uh, due to the symmetries of the theory, will also have. Okay. Are there questions about this? No. Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll repeat this in, in a way. And I'll repeat this one once more because I think it's important. So theories in this regime with large n uh, gauge theories will always have a uh, string dual. The string dual might not be easy to analyze. Um, only some special circumstances are met, like high coupling, the string dual will be approximated by gravity. Now, QCD is a theory, uh, even large n QCD, so QCD with a large number of colors, would be a theory where lambda is probably going to be of order 1. Uh, well, lambda runs with the energy, but lambda never gets, lambda is either very small or probably of order 1. So, the approximation of gravity might or might not work because we're in the regime where lambda is of order one. Uh, you just do the calculation and you see whether it does work or it doesn't work. You don't have an a priori reason for um, for believing that it would work. Okay. So, and it works well for some cases and and doesn't work for some other things. So there are uh, some things like the bulk viscosity that gravity. Uh, gives you a beautiful value for it in agreement with experiment. And there are some other things like um, 
you know, the, the spectrum of mesons where you really need the, the string, as I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, where gravity doesn't do a good job. Um, okay. Um, now I'd like to, um, in what remains, show you how to do some, some other calculations. So, so far I've uh, discussed general properties and so on. I'll try now to fill in some uh, what they're usually called entries in the dictionary, so how, given a, a field theory problem, how you translate to a gravity problem. I'm going to discuss a few examples just so that you get an idea. Um, you get the idea. Um, well, first, uh, I've, I've discussed it very quickly. Maybe I'll just repeat it in words. I discussed how to calculate correlation functions of a stress tensor. Uh, it was done by sending in gravity perturbations from the boundary and letting them interact in the bulk. Um, uh, if you want me to discuss that in more detail, I can do that. Um, no, not a lot of enthusiasm for that. Well, we could... Um, in, in gauge theories, one sometimes is interested in calculating expectation values of Wilson loops. So. Uh, these are some operators which are defined as uh, the path integral of the gauge field uh, over a circle. Physically, what they are is just um, so expectation values of these things. Um, what they are is essentially the phase factor that is accumulated by a heavy probe quark that moves along the contour C, right? So in the presence of uh, the gauge field, uh, this... Um, this quark factor due to the interaction with the gauge field will get an extra uh, phase factor of this form, which will be influenced by all the gluons that are running around and so on. Okay? If you wish, it contains the, um, all the effects of the radiation of this quark and the interaction of the radiation of the quark with the Jan Mills fields, with the color electric field. In QED, this is trivial, so you have just simply the radiation you can take into account by solving the, by calculating essentially this diagram, the exchange of one photon and exponentiating it. And uh, that just gives you the whole interaction of the trajectory with the radiation. But in a theory with interactions, it's more complicated because you have to sum all these kinds of diagrams. And um, so the radiation itself interacts with itself and creates some other radiation and so on. Um, uh, and okay, so this is related in the gravity or strength dual to taking this contour now defined on the boundary. So this is a contour in R4. Um, so this is uh, R4, some contour. And then you take a surface, a two dimensional surface sigma 2, that um, ends on this contour at the boundary of ADS, of, of the space. And you calculate you find the minimal area surface that ends on this contour and uh, the expectation value of this Wilson loop to lead in order is given by um, by e to the minus tension of the string times uh, the area of the surface um, and this has a behavior which generically goes like square root of lambda that is the behavior of the string tension and strong coupling uh, times the area in units where the radius of ADS is equal to 1. Okay, so this is a purely geometric quantity that depends only on the geometry of the contour and nothing else. And this is the, the whole dependence of the coupling at strong coupling. Of course, uh, there will be further corrections here of, uh, of order 1 plus, uh, plus terms of order 1 over square root of lambda. This is the behavior for lambda much bigger than 1. Okay. And the behavior for lambda much less than 1 is the same as the QED result. You just take this leading interaction and uh, that would be when you neglect the effects of radiation in itself. Okay. Now, one thing you can calculate, one, one related calculation is the calculation of the quark and the anti-quark potential, where uh, you take uh, the quark line and the anti-quark line as two points separated by some distance L on the boundary. Then in the bulk, it corresponds to a surface that um, goes between these two, uh, these two positions. And the potential is computed as the energy of this uh, string, or the actual length of the string, but with uh, 
the ADS metric. Measure with the ADS metric, not measure with the flat space metric. And if we measure the, the distance between these two with the flat space metric, we would get a potential which would be linear in L. But if we measure it with the ADS metric, we get actually a potential which goes like 1 over L. Okay? So the, the reason it goes like 1 over L is because as you separate them more, they go deeper and deeper into the interior, where the warp factor is smaller and smaller. And actually, you get the opposite dependence than the one you naively would have expected. And the dependence on lambda for strong coupling is square root of lambda, as it was here. And for weak coupling is lambda over L. Okay. So that's the same as the QED result multiplied by a factor of n, because there are n possible quarks for the n possible char color charges for the quark and the anti-quark. OK. Um, um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, maybe I should uh, uh, elaborate a little more on this picture. So naively, if you have a quark, so we discussed that in QCD, the for a quark and anti-quark, we get this color electric flux that does this, right? With constant energy. And then this would lead to a potential, which is the tension of the QCD string times L. OK, this is L. If this tube uh, starts having constant energy density. In a scale invariant theory, the picture looks more like uh, the one you have in, in, you know, in ordinary electrodynamics um, of the flux lines spreading everywhere. And when you, when you start separating these charges, the part of the energy that depends on the separation decreases like 1 over L, OK? Always, of course, with a minus sign. Now, the difference between these two uh, in the gauge gravity duality will be related to the geometry of the space that you uh, consider. So in the case that the theory is scale invariant and you have ADS space, you'll have this behavior always, and the theory will not be confining. But you can have this gauge gravity duality also for situations where the boundary theory is not scale invariant. So scale invariance was useful for explaining the simplest case. but. In cases where you don't have scale invariance, no scale invariance, then um, the behavior of the warp factor, recall we had uh, this redshift factor that was very large near the boundary, pushing things toward the interior. But in confining theories, what this will do is it will uh, rise again, okay, or the space will terminate. And what's important is that there will be a minimum value for this warp factor is similar to what was happening with the warp factor or the. This factor is sometimes called warp factor, sometimes called redshift factor, sometimes called gravitational potential. They are all closely related things. For the purposes of this talk, they're all the same. Um, if you want, you can ask me the difference. Um, so you, so the, any object will be one to sit at a particular value of c. For the case of a particle, what this means is the following. So r recall that the distance from here is the size, right? What this is saying is that in a confining theory like this, if you have an object, it will minimize its energy by acquiring a specific size, OK, this particular size. It doesn't want to be smaller, it doesn't want to be bigger. That's similar to what happens to the proton in QCD, where it, it has a given size, the preferred size, OK, given by essentially the dynamics of, um, of QCD. Um, of just the confining dynamics of QCD. I mean, the mass of the, the proton doesn't come from the mass of the quarks. It comes from the uh, confining interactions of uh, strong, the strong interactions of QCD. OK. Um, and the same happens for the string. Imagine you uh, have this picture. And, and now uh, we do the same thing, but for a string. So let me. There is an extra direction here. And again, so if we have a string that is stretching along that spatial direction, the whole string will want to slide down up until it uh, reaches this minimum size here. Okay? And if it's reaching some points on the boundary, well, OK, we'll reach the points on the boundary here. But in the middle, we'll want to settle down to this minimum size. So that minimum size, or that, mean that position in the radial direction, corresponds to this equilibrium size of the string. 
And at long distances, it will give you a confining potential similar to the QCD string. Okay. And finally, I would like to uh, end up in uh, by discussing how um, discussing some black hole thermodynamics uh, issues. The first is the first point I like to make is. Um, this great gravity duality does not describe only empty ADS space. It describes this ADS space with anything it can have inside. So it only describes, it describes spaces that are asymptotically far away. They look like empty ADS space, far away where the gravitational potential rises. But in the middle, it can be anything. It can have gravitons, it can have black holes, it can have whatever you want. Um, in particular, it can have black holes. And an object that is uh, interesting to consider is to uh, have a black brain, the non-extreme and analog of the extremal black brain we discussed before. Um, and I think I probably will not write down the metric. So it's some metric which um, where uh, we have the boundary. So now if, if we draw again the gravitational potential G00, so we have it rises near the boundary. And then at some point, at uh, some particular point it goes actually to zero um, and in terms of proper distance it goes to zero linearly so that it has a finite Hawking temperature um, so pictori pictorially we can say that this we have the boundary and then we have the black hole horizon um, at some distance uh, C let's say C horizon C horizon from the boundary okay and the new features compared to the previous one is um, first that we have a temperature. So the previous space had zero temperature. This has a finite temperature. And it also has a uh, non-trivial, first of all, this configuration will not be boost invariant. If we make a boost, there's a preferred rest frame, which is the rest frame in which uh, this object is at rest. And this uh, in the bulk corresponds to, to the young men's theory at finite temperature. So you have the Yammel's theory where the gluons are uh, moving around, uh, jiggling, like uh, if we wish a plasma or a fluid. Uh, they are strongly interacting, so calling it a plasma is a bit of a misnomer, but they are strongly interacting uh, gluons um, at finite temperature, and they are supposedly uh, the same as this uh, black hole uh, at uh, finite temperature. And the entropy of this uh, plasma is supposed to be equal to the entropy of Bekenstein and Hawking of black holes, which is the area of the horizon divided by G Newton. This is the, fam this is the gravitational entropy of black holes. Um, it's just purely ge geometric quantity that um, depends only on the area of the black hole. And um, well, do, do I need to explain uh, where this comes from, or should I explain it? Yes. Um, well, should I explain why black holes have a temperature? Also, okay, that would take more than five minutes that I have. Um, well, let me just mention one thing. So, if um, so, black holes have a temperature which is related to uh, essentially the slope of uh, this, or or the or essentially the gravitational force you have here at the horizon. And the if you write down the first law of thermodynamics, d a d e or d m equal to or d free energy equal to t d s, right? So the amount of uh, change in the total energy or free energy, um, the, the amount of total change in the internal energy is equal to this change in the entropy. Uh, you know what the mass of the black hole is as a function of the temperature, and then you can calculate the entropy, um, and that gives you this formula. It gives you a very simple formula. So the formula for the temperature is a little more complicated, but the formula for the entropy ends up being nicer and more geometric. I, I haven't explained to you where the temperature comes from. Um, uh, well, do you, do you guys want me to explain the temperature of black holes? Some yes, some no's. Okay. 
Let, let me finish this story and then I'll, at the end uh, you can ask me. Um, um, so we have this entropy which is purely geometrical and classical. Uh, comes from just the classical action. And this is supposed to be the same as the entropy of this gas of gluons, that if you were at weak coupling, you would calculate as, let's say, T cubed, and um, that's just dimensional an analysis, and then a factor of n squared, which measures the number of species you have, because you have, and each gluon can have indices that run from one to, two indices that run from one to n, so you have n squared gluons. So you have this plus time some simple factors of pi and so on. Okay, so um, when you compute the area, you find that the area is some geometric quantity and ends up being, again, t cubed uh, divided by this g newton. And the newton constant, the coupling constant of the string or gravity theory, as uh, I mentioned, go went like 1 over n or 1, the coupling goes like 1 over n and the, the newton constant, the square of the coupling goes like n squared. So this is, again, also goes like n squared. And the two have a very similar form, but they have a different coefficient. So if this is at weak coupling, so this is lambda much less than 1, it has some coefficient, and at strong coupling it has a different coefficient. So if we were to draw if we were to draw, for example, beta times the free energy as a function of lambda, then at weak coupling it has some value, let's say 1, and at strong coupling it has some value of 3 quarters. And what's really being ever computed are these aspects of the curve. So the value of strong coupling plus the first correction, the value of coupling plus the first correction, and in between it's somehow supposed to go between one and the other. Okay. Now, so if you're interested in calculating something at strong coupling in this theory, you can calculate it using this gravity description. Right? So if you believe in the if you believe in the relationship, um, you just calculate it using the gravity description. Okay. If you want to check the description, then you have to do a hard calculation and calculate this whole curve. That's not known in, with present methods how to do. But um, if you believe in the relationship, then you just calculate it using gravity. And you can calculate a bunch of things related to uh, thermal um, of this um, finite temperature density of quarks and gluons. For example, um, well here I what I've discussed so far is the equilibrium property. So we have the black hole uh, completely straight and translation invariant. Um, but you could uh, make a small perturbation on this, on this black hole horizon, S put a little wiggle. This little wiggle would represent a wheel of density. So here the fluid is a little more dense than at some other position. And this wiggle will expand and dissipate. Uh, that's what you expect from uh, this is the black hole picture, and of course the corresponding uh, picture at finite temperature is the same. So you have the yam mills theory with a bunch of stuff which has some density. Let me. This is the profile of the density. It's constant, but you can add a little wiggle. And if you add a little wiggle, this wiggle will dissipate and will eventually go back to equilibrium. Okay. And um, it will have a non-zero. So this this wiggle will not oscillate as it would. Uh, do if there was no dissipation. Because there is dissipation, this oscillation is damped, and there is characteristic damping time. Um, and here on this side, what happens is you have this wave near the horizon of the black hole, and the wave falls into the black hole. And so after a while, it has fallen into the black hole, and the system goes back to equilibrium and to a uniform density. Okay. So falling into the black hole is the same as equilibration uh, in the boundary theory. And you can this equilibration time for this long wavelength cita citations and so on are, is dominated by the bulk viscosity, which you can, by the uh, shear viscosity, sorry, uh, and the shear viscosity can be translated here into the absorption rate essentially of this, of these waves near the horizon. And you get the, an actually very simple answer for this absorption, for the, for this absorption rate, which is the absorption rate is essentially proportional to the area of the black hole. And the entropy is also proportional to the area. So if you compute the difference, the ratio between the area and the, um, the, the ratio between the um, viscosity um, and the entropy density, 
uh, you find that this uh, 1 over 4 pi, uh, which is just simply a number, and, um, and this is a very low number, which, um, uh, which, which represents the fact that we have very strong interactions. So the viscosity in a fluid is very small when the interactions are uh, very large. Okay, so you need to, um, if the interactions are very small, you can always transfer a lot of momentum from some region of the fluid that is moving at one velocity to a region that is very, very far away moving at a very different velocity. And this is a very efficient mechanism for transferring momentum across a velocity gradient and will give you a very uh, large viscosity. So very dilute gas will have a very large viscosity. Um, but uh, very strongly interacting fluid as strong interacting as to give you a gravity dual, has this very low value of the viscosity. It's interesting it is non-zero. And it's also interesting that uh, when people do experiments at rig and so on, they see also a very low value of the viscosity, sort of uh, within, this, uh, within this value to uh, within an order of magnitude, let's say, um, of this value. Uh, while, en while any approach that looks starts from the weak coupling side will tend to give you larger larger values because the, you, you start at the large value at weak coupling. Um, okay, so maybe uh, maybe I'll end. Well, I'm over time, so I'll I'll probably end here and open for questions and or comments. Thank you. Um, could you perhaps uh, explain a little bit further the temperature of the black hole, like you said? Yeah, yeah. OK, so the easiest way to understand the temperature of the black hole is in Euclidean space. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain it from that point of view. And well, maybe, maybe I'll also explain it from a Lorentzian point of view. But it'll be, yeah, may, maybe I'll explain first from a Lorentzian point of view, and then a qualitative way from the Lorentzian point of view, and then. Uh, so if, if you. Um, the temperature of the black hole is related to a simpler uh, physical phenomenon, which is the fact that if you are an accelerating observer, something called the Unruh effect. Well, anyway, the name doesn't, it's not important. So the point is that if you are an accelerating observer in flat space, you will see a temperature. So imagine you're in, the flat, in flat space vacuum, you're in a rocket, and you turn on your rocket, and you start accelerating. You put a thermometer through the window, you will see um, some temperature, okay? And this temperature will be uh, proportional to the acceleration, and it's actually equal to the acceleration in units where C and H bar and so on, are, and K and all the units to be normally set to one are set to one. Um, okay, so it's a very tiny temperature in, in ordinary units. Um, I mean, just to uh, give you a more physical idea is if you translate temperature to wavelength, right? to 1 over wavelength, um, and again, acceleration also to 1 over wavelength, uh, then the temperature and the wavelength are the same. Okay. Well, that's the same as saying that they, have the, they are the same order, but for ordinary accelerations, uh, these wavelengths are very, very large, okay. because you have the factor of C, which um, makes them very, very large. Uh, okay. But anyway, so the idea is that if you have an observer who accelerates very, very, f well, or accelerates at any constant rate, this observer will see a temperature. Now, how can you at least more or less qualitatively understand why you would see a temperature? Um, I, I won't explain, so I'll explain it from uh, the point of view of uh, an observer who is in Minkowski space. So you're an observer in Minkowski space, and you have this guy here uh, following this accelerated trajectory, and he has a thermometer, and his thermometer has let's say, two, uh, two levels, right? The, or, well, the, the thermometer has many, is a system with many energy levels. Well, let's say many energy levels, or you could have two levels anyway. So many energy levels. And so it has this physical system that is moving across with him. And it's moving along an accelerated trajectory. And if you have 
um, some system that um, couples to the fields outside and is moving uh, along an acceler accelerating trajectory, you expect it to emit radiation, to emit the branch cellular radiation, right? So if you have a, char a charged particle that is moving, you expect it to emit radiation. If you have a couple of uh, positive and negatively charged particles that are moving, you also expect them to uh, emit uh, some radiation. They will emit a little bit less, but they still emit some radiation. And, and that is roughly the uh, mechanism for uh, the emission of, uh, of this radiation, is that you have some system here with several levels whose uh, energies can change as you, um, as you emit radiation, and so due to the acceleration, you'll emit Bremsstrahlen radiation. That same Bremsstrahlen radiation is seen as by the person who is uh, here as exciting or de-exciting the, the energy levels of this system, and it's actually seen as a temperature. Okay? Th this requires some calculation that I'm not, uh, I'm not explaining. Perhaps the simplest way to explain it uh, is to, um, again, resort to the, Euclidean, um, to the Euclidean story. So here, in order to make this accelerating trajectory more manifest, it's convenient <coughs> to choose uh, the coordinates of flat space in this way. Okay, this is just flat space uh, written in unfamiliar coordinates where um, trajectories of constant rho are these accelerated trajectories, right, with various constant accelerations. Um, and uh, again, if you fix tau and move to different values of rho, we select the trajectory. Okay? So here, an observer who is sitting, uh, who is accelerating uniformly, has a world line which is rho equal to rho zero. So it's fixed at some particular value of rho. Is this, this is just some choice of coordinates. Th these are called Rindler coordinates. You have never seen them. Um, well, they are related to if you write t, um, t plus x t plus x equal to rho e to the plus minus tau. So this is the explicit relation to the ordinary t and x coordinates. Anyway, so that's this. And now if uh, so this is a time translation invariant situation. So you can go to Euclidean time, and this becomes d rho squared plus rho squared d tau. Sorry, I, I put the minus sign in the wrong place. So this is the time direction. Um, so now we go to Euclidean time. We have d tau Euclidean. Um, and oh. in general, this space would be conical depending on the period, period of Euclidean time. So we, we can. Um, and we will remove the conical singularity if tau Euclidean becomes identified with tau Euclidean plus 2 pi. Okay? And in this case, we remove this uh, conical singularity. And then we get flat space. So there, we just get ordinary flat Euclidean space. Now, this is the correct thing to do if we are in Euclidean space. Because recall that if we were to analytically continue, for forget about these coordinates, just go back to t and x coordinates, and we continue to Euclidean time, then we just get the ordinary Euclidean space. Okay? And in ordinary Euclidean space, the angle is, is identified with period 2 pi. But this ordinary identification of the angle from the point of view of these coordinates looks like a finite temperature. Because it's in Euclidean time, you have a Euclidean time with a finite um, period. Right? So, um, so whatever you calculate here, like a correlation function of, uh, of fields at various times and positions, Will give, um, will give values which will be consistent with the Euclidean time periodicities and such that when you translate them with Lorentzian time, you'll get uh, finite uh, temperature results. So if, if in Euclidean time you had a circle, when you translate back to Lorentzian time, you'll get finite temperature behavior. Um, I'm sort of exp explaining this perhaps more direct ways, but that require your, the knowledge of you should know that if, uh, well, this fact that if Euclidean time is periodic, then the Lorentzian time behavior would be finite temperature. Um, yeah? When you describe the conditions uh, in which the ADS-CFT correspondence is valid, yeah. you didn't uh, put any conditions on the uh, g young mills explicitly? Uh, well, I, I expressed them in terms of lambda, which is g squared n, yes. Is, is there a meaning of g young mills separately? Yes, uh, yes, yes. 
Yes. Yes, yes. The, the, the reason I explicitly uh, express lambda because that's the combination that sets the ratio between the string tension and the radius of ADS. And that's a very physically important ratio. The G square Jan Mills is the, the 10 dimensional string coupling. So in, ten dim in this 10 dimensional space, we, we remember I, we had ADS5. I, I, never, I never talked about the sphere, but we really have the sphere. And in this 10 dimensional space, there is a 10 dimensional string coupling, and that's uh, G Jan Mills. Uh, by the way, I, I also never talked about the theta angle. So the Jan Mills theories have a theta angle, which is a single second parameter. Mm -hmm. That's the second massless field that we have in this, uh, the expectation value of a second massless field that we have in 10 dimensions. You said that the viscosity was very low because there's very efficient momentum transfer yes. from the couple of the system. Is, is it I mean no, no, not very efficient, the opposite of efficient. Well, yeah, so that yeah, was yeah, well yeah, yeah. viscosity. Yeah. There's a small resistance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, wh what you want to have low viscosity is that two layers are moving very fast with low transverse momentum that is flowing from uh, across a velocity gradient, right? You have a fluid that is flowing fast here, and as you fall in this direction, it's flowing less and less fast. You want to have low momentum transfer from here to there, right? If you have weak coupling, this particle, let's say particle has a tiny momentum in this direction, well, will travel for a huge time up to here, and then it will interact. And the difference in momentum between here and here is huge because it's of the difference in velocity. And you will transfer a lot of momentum in that direction. At first sight, you might. Yeah. So. You could also say that due to the strong coupling, they all equilibrate at the same velocity and then the other way around. Yeah, but what happens at strong coupling is that, uh, so this gets bumped to something that it gets, it hits this guy and so on, very close to here, where the velocity is very, also very uh, similar. So it's not so efficient as transferring the coupling. They are transferring the momentum because the velocities were too equal. Um. I mean, this, this ratio here is equal to one over the, uh, essentially the mean free path in units of the density. And, Questions or comments? No one, no one else then. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, sure. Yeah.